Let's turn our Bibles open to Revelation chapter 14. The title of today's lesson that's going to cover Revelations 14, 15, and 16 is The Harvest of the Earth. We remember in chapter 13 that Satan's agents, the beast, came out of the sea. A second beast came out of the lamb, and of course that's the false prophet. And those that succumbed to the pressures of the beast, the Roman Empire, received the mark of the beast, six, six, six. And of course the concern of Jesus, the concern of the Apostle John, was that the church itself was beginning to lose its distinctiveness. That they were getting sucked into the ways and the teachings and the lifestyle of the Roman Empire. That in fact, they even came to a point where they were compromising their faith so much that they were even bowing the knee to Domitian, the emperor at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, about 95 A.D., and calling him Lord and God. But we know there's only one Lord and God, and that's God Almighty. Amen, church? And so now, we pick it up in chapter 14, in verse 1. Then I looked, and there before me was a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, of course, we remember the 144,000 from chapter 7. That's simply 12 times 12, which 12 represents the people of God, and 10 times 10 times 10, which means all-inclusive. So these are the first fruits of the people of God, the saved people, if you will, that are in heaven. And the Bible says that in this next vision that he gets, he sees the Lamb, he sees Jesus standing on Mount Zion. So Jesus is on the high ground. Are you with me right here? Now Satan's dominating the earth and the sea, but Jesus is on Mount Zion. And the Bible says, also with him are the 144,000, those that have endured, those that are saved. Let's read on. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like the loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was that of a harpist playing the harps. They must have been playing pretty loud. Amen, guys? And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths, and they are blameless. So right here, we see that Jesus... It's making it very clear in this revelation. Hey, you either have the mark of the beast, 666, or you have the mark of the lamb. There is no neutrality when it comes to God. Are you with me here, church? And the Bible says right here that the redeemed were singing a new song. And it says, these were they that didn't defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. Now, certainly, sexual purity is of the utmost need to be distinctive. Are you with me here, church? But in actuality, what this is talking about is something even beyond simply sexual purity. We know from the Old Testament and the New that when someone is unfaithful to God, the allegory is often used as we commit adultery with God. We become a harlot with God. We became a prostitute to God. And so right here, it's that analogy that's being used, in fact. Because obviously, we know that amongst the 144,000, there are women, right? Amen, guys? And so right here, the reference says, these are the men who didn't defile themselves with women. So obviously, he's talking about men and women who had kept their distinctiveness, if you will. That their lives really were holding on to the Word of God. As a matter of fact, no lie was found in their mouths for they are blameless. Now, in the midst of this unfaithfulness to God that he is warning them about, what was the issue? What was the enticement of the Roman Empire? It was the enticement of the beast. 
And what we saw in chapter 13 was that the dragon, Satan, gave power to the beast, to the Roman Empire, gave power to the beast, the lamb beast, so to speak, of the land, and in fact became the false prophet. And so in essence, what he's saying is, when you worship the beast, when you go the ways of the Roman Empire, you are in fact worshiping Satan. And see, the disciples need to be woken up. How much more so disciples today? We see ourselves giving on end a little bit, and we try to be a friend to God and a friend to the world. James chapter 4. But in fact, the Bible says you are an enemy of God if you are a friend to the world because you have lost your distinctiveness. Now, one of the areas that I think people struggle in is in the area of purity. I mean, we are just attacked daily by the way that people wear their clothes. We are attacked daily by the advertising on TV. We are attacked daily by the pornography that's available on the Internet. We are attacked daily by suggestive conversation at work or at school. And sometimes our very hearts betray us because we start to be enticed by someone of the opposite sex that is not a disciple. And if there's any quicker ticket out of the kingdom of God, it's when we are starting to be drawn into a relationship. When we are seduced by the world. When we are seduced by those that do not bear the mark of the Lamb. And so one of the things that we just got to get hard line about, church, is that disciples date disciples because who you date and who you marry is largely going to determine where you spend eternity. Are you with me right here? Now, this call for faithfulness goes on. And we read in verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. Is this awesome, guys? And he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. You know, right here, if it's an eternal gospel, it's an always gospel, is it not? Yeah. And the Bible, right here, we understand the book of Revelation is not just written figuratively about the future. It's addressed to the disciples there, the seven churches of Asia, the disciples that were, in fact, in a battle for their very souls. And so he's saying, hold, the eternal gospel is for every nation, tribe, language and people we need to get it down that over and over and over and over in the book of revelation there is the call to have the vision to make a difference in the entire world are you with me here church verse 7 he said in a loud voice fear god and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come worship him who made the heavens the earth the sea and the springs of water a second angel followed and said fallen Fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Well, now, what are we talking about here? Well, we've already talked about the figurative language used in the book of Revelation when a city is imposed. And we've talked about Sodom and Gomorrah representing sin. We've talked about Jerusalem representing heaven. And right here, Babylon is a very simple explanation. We know from the scriptures that Judah was sent into exile when King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kingdom conquered them in 586 B.C. At that time, the temple of God was annihilated. Now, in 70 A.D., the second temple, the one that was restored, remember, by Nehemiah and company, the second temple was destroyed by the Roman armies in 70 A.D. And so the, the, the Jews, as well as the early Christians, began to call Rome, the Roman Empire, Babylon. Because Babylon had sent them, so to speak, into exile because the temple had once more been destroyed. And right here, he's saying... Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It's talking about this is going to happen. Which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Of course, the idea here is getting drunk on the maddening wines. I mean, wine, if you overdrink, I mean, it causes you to do mad things, does it not? And he's talking about that Rome has led them astray with these adulteries. 
these elements that have taken them away from God. Violence, greed, and immorality. And he says they're drinking the very poison of these adulteries. Verse 9. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or the hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on parts of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. And the church said, Amen. I mean, right here, I mean, it's, it's, it's an intense scene. He says, judgment is coming. And in contrast to the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the disciples that are the incense of heaven, now all of heaven is smelling the sulfur of burning souls that have drunk the maddening wine of Babylon, of the world. See, bottom line, God is saying, disciples, hang on. That's what he says right here in verse 12. This calls for patient endurance. Be patient. Endure. Because people are going to get what their lives deserve. And then he says, write this down. You can be sure of this. Blessed are the dead who die in the name of the Lord. They will rest from their labor. And being a disciple is a labor, is it not? For their deeds will follow them. He says, listen, your deeds will not be forgotten. Have you ever just felt like no one really knows what I do? And then you get discouraged. He's saying, God knows. And your deeds are coming with you. You know, it's kind of a very powerful, I think, scripture for us this week. I think in a very real way. I think most of us remember in October, Tony Aragon, who, who's an awesome disciple, but he himself had struggled in his faith. And the Holy Spirit worked it so that his father started becoming open to the gospel. Now, his father, from a worldly point of view, was going through tough things. Diabetes. Cancer. And yet, when we go through tough things in our lives, when we experience the so-called partial judgment of God, that is for a purpose. It's to call us to repent. And sure enough, when these issues came into Tony's father's life, he became open. And last October 19th, Guadalupe, he was baptized into Christ. Is that awesome? And some would say sadly, but the Bible would say otherwise, our brother died this Wednesday. He passed away. And the world mourns that. Because the world, at best, has no hope of heaven. But as disciples, we remember these words. They will rest from their labor. He's not going to feel any more pain. For his deeds, his godly deeds, are going to follow him to heaven. Now, don't you think that Guadalupe's patient endurance in going through the last stages of cancer was worth it? And this turning to God is amazing. And so right here, we're reminded, and this is our first point, we have got to remain faithful. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. In verse 12, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Right here, we find, as the book of Revelations matches, that we must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, a lot of times we look around and we see someone that we love or someone that we knew, and they fall away. And our first feeling is blame the church. But biblically speaking, the Bible says 
We've got to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, on the other hand, I do think the Bible also teaches something that is not in contradiction. But he also says, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, one of these little ones to fall away, it is better for you to have a millstone. That's like a mega giant stone. <laughs> tied around your neck and then dropped into the sea. Let's t- face it, guys. No one, no one swims with a giant millstone around their neck. Bottom line, you're toast. Now, those concepts do not stand in contradiction. Those concepts work together. Because every one of us must own 100% where we are at spiritually. And if you're not doing well spiritually, you cannot have a victim mentality. Oh, this person did that. That person did this. This thing happened to me here. No. you got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And yet we're also called upon to have concern for one another. As a matter of fact, we're even responsible for one another. You know, one of my jobs as the evangelist is not to do the work of the ministry, though as a Christian I'm supposed to, but my job as the evangelist is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so if I find a Bible study group or a particular ministry not doing real well, then it's my job to go into that ministry and try to help them with the scriptures to understand how do we, how do, we do more for God. And so one of the uh, uh, house churches that I had become aware of was having some challenges with the Hess's house church. And I, I talked to Alan beforehand. I was going to share this, so amen. I didn't talk to Lisa, but amen, sis. <laughs> It's all good. It's a happy ending. Amen. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, hey, guys, I, I know the house church over there is struggling. And Lisa had written us an email about particularly some of the older single sisters were having a lot of challenges. And I appreciate Lisa's heart very much. And I said, hey, let's get together. So we got together Tuesday night, and they dragged along with them the Lundies and everything because they are helping on out with the new soccer ministry. And uh, we got together, and I just said, hey, you know, what do you guys think is really going on? And we talked about where, where they were at spiritually, because that's where you've got to start. And then we just talked about the general ministry. And I said, well, you know, bro, sometimes I just don't understand, because, I mean, we're, we're having a, a D time once a week. I mean, the Lundy spoke up. Yeah, we have an awesome D time with the bird lots. We always talk about our marriage, and we're getting our marriage discipled. I said, well, you know, bro, God appreciates that, and I appreciate that. I'm sure Sandy does, too, especially. But you know something? That's really not what discipling's all about. Let's look at a couple scriptures to see what discipling's all about. How do we really help one another? How do we really get a ministry going? And by chance, uh, we've been studying in first principles of the book of Acts. And so we went to Acts chapter 19. And we looked at Paul's ministry as the kind of ministry that we as leaders need to have. So in verse 8, I read them this scripture. Acts 19, verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now that's particularly apropos for us studying the book of Revelation, right? Because the book of Revelation is addressed to the seven churches of Asia. And so right here, Paul begins the ministry in Ephesus, in particular in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. little campus ministry action right here. Amen, guys? And the Bible says that in two years' time, all of Asia, that's the western part of modern-day Turkey or Asia Minor, had heard the word Lord. In other words, all of those seven churches that we that we talk about and are studying about, they were started during that two-year time. Does that excite you right here? Now, the Bible teaches right here very, very clearly that the pattern of lifestyle, the pattern of discipling, was not a one-time, hey, let's see if our marriages are okay for two hours. It was an everyday walk with one another. That's what discipling is. And we just got the scriptures on over. And, you know, and the four of them, the, the Lundies and Hesses, were very responsive. I said, let me show you another scripture to show you even more of what that was all about. Go to Acts chapter 20. 
Right here in Acts chapter 20, Paul's in a rush to get back to Jerusalem. And so he asks for the Ephesian elders to meet him in Miletus. Now, if one is an elder in the Bible, you've got to be married and you've got to have kids that are disciples. Now look what Paul says to them in verse 18. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. So, these guys that he was speaking to were some of his very first converts. They were some of the people that had walked with him in Acts 19, 8 through 10. How do I know that? Look at verse 31. He says, so be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning Each of you, night and day, with tears. You see, these people had a daily relationship, a daily discipling relationship. Now, there were times when Paul had a job, and there were times when Paul didn't have a job, but these guys always had jobs. You know, sometimes we think, oh, no, I have a job, I have a wife, I have a family. Let me pay the preacher to do my Christianity for me. That's a denominational church. We are a church of the Bible. Are you with me right here? And the Bible teaches that in order to have maturity, and that's what we all want, it takes discipling. Now, each one of those Ephesian elders, they were personally responsible for their own salvation. Amen? But the second thing that comes clear right here, yeah, they went after God, but they also went after discipling. They also went after discipling. What was the kind of discipling? Was it a little group dynamic they had once a week just to deal with their marriages? (laughs) No. It was every day. And there must have been some emotional sessions. They really got in there. Because you got to get in there when there are hurt feelings and there's sin. Amen, guys? And this is what happened in the Bible. Now, i got to ask you a question. Number one, are you working out your salvation with fear and trembling? Are you really going after your relationship with God? Are you blaming where you're at spiritually on yourself, on other people, or your situation? Secondly, do you have discipling to change your life? Discipling is not an option. It is the very plan of God. But you've got to go disciple. And if you're a leader and your situation is not moving, then you've got to say, oh, man, I've got to get back to the Bible. I've got to start discipling a few people every day in order to move that ministry. Yes, I've got to help with their marriage, or I've got to help with this particular challenge in their life, but discipling is forcefully advancing the kingdom of God. So that we can get ourselves to heaven. Amen, guys? And bring as many people as possible with us. See, that's the challenge. Number one, remain faithful. Let's get back to the book of Revelation. This is an incredible next passage, guys. Verse 14, chapter 14. Another vision comes. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud. And seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Well, well, of course, who is this? Well, we know from Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, like the son of man is Jesus. So Jesus is on this cloud. He's wearing a crown of gold. The crown means he has triumphed, amen? And the gold represents his martyrdom. And the Bible says, there he's sitting on this cloud, and and then he's got a sharp sickle in his hand. Verse 15. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he was seated on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Wow, is that exciting, guys? That's the vision. The entire earth was harvested by Jesus. Well, let's read on. Another angel. Man, these angels are flying all over the place. We're going to have to talk about those angels a little bit later on in the study, I think. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Man, everybody's got sickles. Amen. Still another angel. Holy cow. Still another angel who had charged the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had a sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. 
They were trampled in the wine press outside the city. And the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 1,600 stadia, about 200 miles. Is that intense? Well, you see, there are two harvests of the earth right here. The first harvest of the earth is by Jesus. And he harvests all those people that are going to be saved. But then there is a second harvest. This one is done by an angel with a sharp sickle. And it says he's going to take this sharp sickle and harvest the ripe grapes. And, of course, that kind of analogy goes back to Jeremiah chapter 5 and 6, where it talks about the people of God being clusters of grapes. And he takes the ones that are still good and makes a remnant out of them. Or, of course, we still have our analogy in John 15 about how the vine grows and, you know, we're produced fruit. Amen, church? So this concept is well known. And yet at the same time, he says, take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster grapes from the earth's vine because they're ripe. They're ready. They've heard everything. And the Bible says the angel takes the sickle, swings it, and gathers the grapes, and then throws it into the great wine press of God's wrath. And then, the Bible says, they're trampled. I mean, you've seen all the movies. You know, you see all those people trampling the, 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 the um, grapes into wine, right? That's what's happening. He's, they're trampling. Except these are not good grapes. These are bad grapes. And, of course, the whole idea is that the red grape produces the grape juice, which is red, that looks like blood. And it says this is done outside the city because... Inside the city is the people of God, right? So this is done outside the city. And the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridle. About that high. And for a distance of 1,600 stadia, almost 200 miles. 200 miles of blood, six feet deep. Well, what's this mean? Well, we understand. 16 is... Four times four and four is created order. 1,600 is four times four and ten times ten. Ten being all inclusiveness. He's saying the judgment of God is going to be over all creation. And no one will escape. And it is going to be flat bloody. It's going to be flat bloody. You see... The harvest of the earth has one harvest of souls, salvation. And the second harvest of souls, damnation. You know, even our figure that a lot of times I use on Halloween. Remember the grim reaper? Well, that comes comes right from here. The grim reaper. The grim reaper has that little sickle. You know, he's going to harvest you. Remember Halloween? (laughs) Harvest... Except the Grim Reaper, it turns out, isn't some evil dude that lives across the street in the basement. It's an angel of God. The angel of God is the Grim Reaper. And death is an instrument of God. And will come upon those who have been given every chance and refuse to repent. Now, if you're a disciple and you've begun to be seduced by the beast or the false prophet, who in fact are, if you will, kind of puppets of the dragon, and you're hearing about there's only two harvests, you're going, whoa, I want to be in the first harvest of salvation and I want to make sure I want to take as many people with me. That's why he says, write this down, for blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. You know, there's got to be an urgency in our patience. And right here in this passage, God is saying, hey, it's about over, guys, the judgment. Not the final judgment, but this period of judgment And persecution. 
And he says, just hang in there. Because what's, what, what happens to us when we get o- overloaded, overwhelmed with bad thing after bad thing after bad thing after bad thing? We just get a point and say, I'm, I'm just going to quit. And God is saying, don't quit. Just endure for a little while longer. It's all going to be worth it. You know, I don't know about you. I have been flat inspired by the Latin ministry, haven't you? And, uh, I mean, I've just been so inspired by Victor Sr. getting up here, you know, in his broken English, you know, and introducing people and trying to explain how they got saved. Amen. And what's really neat about Victor Sr. is he, like Jesus and like the Apostle John, envisions a harvest. Jesus envisions a harvest. The Apostle John envisions the harvesting of the earth. And last week at Bible Talk Leaders Meeting was one of the most encouraging studies I've heard in a long time. And Vic Senior was talking about this Bible talk in Tigard in the Latin ministry, Spanish-speaking ministry, that uh, didn't have any visitors. Now, can you relate to that kind of a Bible talk? So there, were, there, were, there were no visitors. And Victor and Sonia came to encourage them and teach the Bible talk, but there was no one there. So they gave them some encouraging scriptures. And then at the end, Vic goes, he goes, listen, even though I'm not a member of this Bible talk, I'm going to help you by setting you an example. And I'm going to bring a married couple from this city, Tiger, next Friday to Bible talk. And, you know, everybody's going, hey, man, that inspires me. You know, it always inspires the people when the leaders lead. Are you with me right here, guys? Well, you know how a week goes, whoosh, real fast. So with Victor and uh, Sonia, it went whoosh, real fast, and it's, it's late Friday morning. And, you know, Sonia, being the awesome wife that she is, goes, you know, Victor, and she uses her Spanish accent, uh, remember you promised last week you were going to have a married couple visitor? And you say, well, why a married couple? Because a lot of people have in their mind that married couples just don't have time to become disciples. You know what I'm talking about right here? And so, you know, bottom line, he goes, oh, yeah, I forgot. She says, well, Victor, I'm hungry. Can we first get something to eat? So they go get her a little something to eat. Then they go across the street, and they go to the supermarket in, in the Spanish area there at Hillsboro. Or I guess not Hillsboro, but Tiger. And uh, they go on in there, and they're looking for a couple from Tiger. And so they go around, and Victor would go, are you married? No. He says, okay, amen. Uh, they go, are you from Tiger? No, okay, amen, amen, you're awesome. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, you see Sonia, and Sonia's a little short, and she goes, Victor, Victor, over here, I found somebody. So Victor scurries on over there. He goes, are you married? And she goes, yes. Are you from Tigert? Yes. He goes, I've been looking for you. I've been praying for you. We have been praying that you and your husband are going to come to Bible study tonight. And she goes, we've been praying to find a church. We'll be there. They came, and three weeks ago they were baptized into Christ. Is that awesome, church? See, we got to envision a harvest. Are you with me? Let's get back to the book of Revelation, chapter 15. We read in verse 1. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last, because with them God's wrath is completed. Now, we need to stop right there and remind you, God's wrath being completed is not a sense of absolute of all time, but in this wave of persecution under the Domitian, it was now mature. It was fulfilled. It is now complete in that sense. I think it's also interesting that we see some more angels. Is that incredible, guys? Let's keep reading. Verse 2. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses and the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. 
for your righteous acts have been revealed. You know, right here, we find that John once more is brought back to the throne room of God. Remember our lesson on cosmic worship? And we had the throne of God, and God was sitting on the throne, and all the light that was emulating out of the throne. And then you had the rainbow of promise. You had around them the four living creatures, then the 24 elders, and then you had all the angels and all the, the saved up there in heaven rejoicing in one cosmic worship. Remember that? And then remember the little line that says, and, and before the throne there was a sea of glass, like many throne rooms that we might see in the movies or something like that, of marble. The marble is used in the throne room to reflect the light, so, so to speak, to reflect the glory and the aura of that particular room. And so the first glimpse of the throne room of God, we have indeed the sea of glass before the throne of God. It's a very tranquil but powerful scene, amen. But now look what it says. I saw what looked like a sea of glass, verse 2, mixed with fire. Something's going on in the throne room of God. Judgment is about to come. And interesting, as we read on in that verse, we find that standing beside the sea were all the saved people, those who were victorious, those who had overcome the beast, the seduction of the false prophet, and bottom line, the dragon, Satan himself. And they're just singing. They are so fired up. Verse 5. After this, I looked and in heaven the temple that is the tabernacle the testimony was opened out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues they were dressed in clean shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of god who lives forever and ever and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of god and from his power and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels was completed Wow, what a scene. We just see smoke enveloping the throne room of God. And then, almost unnoticed, it says, and no one could enter the temple. This is different. See, this envisions for us the fact that there is a time that God is patient and gives people a time to repent. And yet, in this particular case, Divine patience has gone its limits. You know, I think some of us, we view God in very austere ways, but other people view God as kind of a, a grandpa type. And you know how grandparents are. You know, you send your kids to grandparents, and they give them every kind of food to eat. They let them stay up late. They let them do whatever they want. And then your kids come home and thinking that's life forever. And a lot of us, that's our view of God. Oh, God's just going to let us do whatever he wants. At the end, you go, come here, kid. Just come up to heaven. Let me tell you something. God is a grandpa to nobody. He's a dad to everybody that wants him to be a dad. Are you with me right here? And right here, the time is up. Well, you know, it's very interesting. We see angels all through this text. So much is happening. But you know what a lot of the disciples on earth were thinking? Nothing's happening. I mean, I just see Rome growing more and more powerful. I see the rules of Rome becoming more and more hard. I see the false beast bringing more and more drama into our lives by pushing us out of the marketplace. I just see Satan totally controlling the land and the sea. And the disciple goes, where is God? There's nothing happening in my life. There's nothing happening around here. And Jesus and John are saying, uh-uh, up in heaven, the angels are at work. I mean, the, the angels are cranking up there. They're cranking. You know, we, we need to remember a time when a, another young fellow thought that nothing was happening. Let's go back to the book of Judges and look at a young man named Gideon. What had happened is that God gave the Israelites into the hand of the Midianites. And the Midianites totally suppressed the Israelites. 
And then the Bible says they started praying for God to deliver them. And when they prayed, we read in verse 12 of chapter 6 of Judges. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Now right here, the angel comes in response to the cries of the people. And the only reason the people were crying is that God had to fold his hands up in heaven and said, Okay, I am going to let sin have its way with you. And you're going to drink those maddening adulteries. And you're going to see what it causes. And they got so distressed in their life, they started calling out to God. And the first thing God does is send down an angel in response to their prayer. And he goes to Gideon and says, hey, mighty warrior, how you doing today? Gideon goes, who are you talking to? He says, I'm talking to you. He says, well, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Why is my life? In such a mess. Have you ever felt that even as a disciple? So where are all the wonders? Where are all those cotton-picking miracles I read about in the Bible? I mean, they're awesome in the Bible. Where are they now? What's his conclusion? God's abandoned us. Have you ever felt abandoned by God? Well, that's how Gideon was feeling. Well, we need to find out more about these angel guys. Let's go to Hebrews 1. In Hebrews 1, we read in verse 14, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Woo! The Bible teaches that the angels are supposed to minister to us. Those that are inheriting salvation. I mean, you got to remember that time when Judah was under the attack of Sennacherib. Sennacherib had 185,000 fighting men. And Hezekiah and Isaiah pray and the people pray. God sends one angel and destroys and kills 185,000 fighting men in one night. Without the people of God even raising a sword. That's a cranking angel. Amen, guys? But he came in response to prayer. We find in the Bible that Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch come together because an angel guided their ways together. See, the angels are ministering spirits to those receiving salvation. But perhaps the most encouraging passage about angels might come from Luke chapter 22. Let's look at that. In Luke 22, we find this scripture at the end of Jesus' ministry. In verse 39, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you'll not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so you'll not fall into temptation. Is this intense here, guys? Jesus even thought it was just too much. He got overwhelmed. He got distressed. How distressed was he? He was sweating drops of blood. But what did he do? He goes to God and prays, Father, not my will, but your will be done. No matter what happens, God, I want to be your servant. I want to do your will. And at that very moment, there's an angel there. To minister to him. Now don't you think it would be really unfair. If Jesus gets an angel and we don't. No. God gives angels to each little baby. But it's not just for the little babies. 
we get angels. And they're flying around there all the time. Our problem is we don't see them. And we go, nothing's happening. My life's a mess. God's abandoned me. Where are all the miracles? Only in the Latin ministry. You know, I can't help but think of a situation that just occurred within our midst in the last month. We had a couple call us from Colorado. Their names were Jason and Susan Bond. You remember they're visiting and everything? They said, listen, the church that we're in is dead. It's lukewarm, and we are dying with it. We want to come out there. We've read on the Internet, well, if, if it's really even half as good as what, what you guys have written, we got to come out there if we're just going to spiritually survive. Well, they came on out, and they loved it. I mean, they were fired up. And so they left that, that Monday. And then, not by chance, but by God, we get this phone call Monday morning that they left about a month ago. And the person was a little bit hesitant because Elena answered the phone. She goes, McKean's. And the guy goes, oh, I didn't expect you to answer your phone. Now, that's not very good when disciples don't expect their leaders to answer the phone. Amen, guys? That's not in the text, but it's a good thing to remember anyway. Amen? Answer your phone. Amen, church? Answer the phone. It might be a miracle waiting to happen. You say, no, it's another problem. Like I said, it might be a miracle waiting to happen. And the guy goes, wow, who is, is this Elena? She says, this is Elena. He says, well, my name is... Kind of almost like he's ashamed. My, my name's Tom. Well, Tom, where are you from? Well, I'm from Wyoming. Oh, wow. It's, and, you know, Elena, of course, being from Cuba, sometimes is a little bit geographically challenged. <laughs> uh, you know, we had a couple out here from Colorado. Is, is Colorado anywhere close to Wyoming? <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're about 80 miles from there. No! We just had a couple visiting from Colorado. They just left this morning. And this Tom Powers goes, well, who was that? Oh, it was uh, Jason and Susan Bond. He goes, no, not Jason Bond. He was my best friend when we planted the Cheyenne Wyoming church. Lance says, well, you got to talk to them about their experience here. He says, well, I, I just got to tell you who I am then. I'm, I'm the guy that used to be the evangelist there at the Cheyenne, Wyoming church. And then when all heck broke loose in the churches, we just received so much criticism. I got overwhelmed. I quit the ministry, and I quit going to the ICOC, and I just went to this Christian church. Well, they practice baptism, like the mainline church of Christ, but, you know, no discipling or nothing. And, and we're hurting. And I was just wondering, because I've been reading the Internet kind of, and I'm seeing that you guys are sort of doing it out there, and I was just wondering if, if, if it really was true. He says, well, you just need to ask Jason. So anyway, they talked every day for the next week. Next thing we know, Tom Powers goes back and he says, listen, I want to I have Emily, myself, that's his wife, we want to come out and visit the church out there in Portland. We, we really see it as, as the hope here because there, there's no more church of only disciples there in Cheyenne, Wyoming. It's totally obliterated. We see it as a hope. Well, I have never seen a couple come in so positive, so on fire. As the powers. But then we got with them the last night. And he says, Kip, this is awesome. We want this to happen in Cheyenne. Do you have a minister ready to go to Cheyenne and preach the word? I says, no, we've really got nobody ready right now. But you know, Tom, you're trained for the ministry. And we'd be willing to disciple you. Oh, no, 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 bro. You, you don't understand. I... I already tried that. I already tried that. But I'll tell you what. I am going to be the most awesome number two man. I will be the great armor bearer for whoever is the preacher that God is going to send here to restart the church. I said, well, bro, there's only one problem with that. There's nobody but you. I've never seen anybody come into Portland so happy and somebody leave so sad. Well... We didn't get a chance to talk for the next week. I think it was God just kind of letting him stew, you know. Has God ever let you kind of stew for a while? This past Tuesday, 
I get a phone call. Hello? Kip, this is Tom Powers of Cheyenne, Wyoming. <laughs> Amen, bro, what's up? He says, bro, I've decided to go for it. We have decided, me and Emily, we are going to start a church of disciples again in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and the miracles of God are going to come back to this great state. See, a lot of people thought nothing was happening in Wyoming. And yet all the angels, zoom, zoom, zoom. They were going on. They had to go get the bonds. They had to work on the internet. They had to be working amongst us. And then the moment came. And then the moment came. See, we need to have a deep conviction. Angels are at work. Let's finish it up. Chapter 16. Book of Revelation. Verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Now, we understand this is the last of the three cycles of the judgments of God, or the partial judgments of God. The first one was the seven seals. Amen? The second was the seven trumpets. And now we have the seven bowls of wrath. Verse 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl in the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped the image. Now this has got to conjure up in our minds once more the plague in Exodus where God struck the Egyptians with boils. Amen? Verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl in the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Well, this has got to remind us once more of the Exodus, where Moses turns the Nile into blood. Verse 5. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord Almighty, true and just are your judgments. See, sometimes we look at the lost world and we say, well, why are they so blessed? And the message of the book of Revelation to the struggling disciple was, listen, I'm giving them time to repent, but there will be a time that I will inflict pain upon them so that they'll repent, but if they do not repent, then that time is over and there will be a harvest of damnation. Verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl in the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch the people of fire. They were seared with intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. You see, all the things that God puts upon us, all the things that God does to a lost world, when he applies the heat, they're meant to cause people to repent. Verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. But they refused to repent of what they'd done. Once more, God exerts even more pain. But they refused to repent. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, prepare the way for the kings of the east. Well, we understand this. We've studied about it before. Certainly the Romans remembered Hannibal about 300 years before, coming from Carthage and upon Rome. And now God is saying to the people of God, he says, listen, I'm going to dry up the Euphrates. Now that should remind us of the Red Sea, right? But it also should remind us of the drying up of the Jordan where the Israelites came into the promised land and became the conquerors of the promised land, amen? And God is saying, hey, I'm going to dry up the Euphrates, and I am going to let the invaders, the Parthians, on in. Rome is not going to stand forever. Read on, verse 15. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. Now, there's nothing uglier than three evil spirits that look like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. So we have the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, as we have God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see that? They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God. So we see a great gathering of the enemies of God. Verse 15, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes 
with him so that he may not go naked to be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sea, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. Even in the midst of this final act of judgment right here, men refused to repent. And sometimes we look at people who refuse to repent and we, we want to take pity on them, but we got to understand this is the decision they have made. This is the decision they have made. Now, I find it really awesome right here, verse 20. It says, every island fled away, and mountains cannot be found. Well, we understand the mountains represent nations. He says, this collection of mountains, you aren't going to find it. The, the empire is going to be dashed. And he says, the islands fled away. Well, now, it's only talked about islands one time in this whole book. That was the fact that John, the apostle, was banished to the island of Patmos because of preaching the word. He's saying, man, there are going to be no more islands. No more banishment. As disciples, we are going to be free because God is going to see to it. Is that awesome right there, guys? Now, I want to talk a little bit about Armageddon, but Armageddon will be our next study here. But I want to make sure that we understand the gist of it. Armageddon is indeed the great battle. And all that it really means is A-R, R means city. And Megiddo is simply a corruption of Megiddo, which is a city that is very famous in the scriptures. We find in Judges chapter 4 and 5 that it was at Megiddo that Deborah and her troops were victorious over Sisera. You remember that that incident when Jael pounded that nail into the temple of Sisera while he was sleeping? Well, it was an awesome story. Amen. (laughs) Then in 1 Kings chapter 9, we find it's around Megiddo in the, in, in the valley of Jezreel that Jehu takes control of the people of God and eventually slays Jezebel. Now you may ask, well, why is so much happening there? Well, it's because that is the entryway that you would want to invade Israel, but it's also the place, if you're Israel, that you want to meet your enemy because it's in a valley. And you can mount around the mountains, and who controls the high point? The Lamb. Amen, guys? So here in Armageddon, the people of God are gathering, and God is making sure the enemies are gathering, and it's going to be one heck of a battle, but we'll talk about it next week. Amen, guys? What is our last point? Very simply, Jesus says in verse 15, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed he who stays awake. You know, we need to be prepared to meet God. Are you prepared to meet your God? You know, this over a week ago, we had one of the most memorable baptisms. We've had, I mean, every baptism's awesome. Every baptism's a miracle. But I'll never forget Sabrina Gardner getting on up there. She's the, the daughter of a denominational preacher. And in tears, she just goes, This is the church I've looked for all of my life. It's the church of the Bible. And I'm just starting to cry myself. You have to ask yourself, after she got baptized, was she ready to go? Yes, amen, guys. She's ready to go, amen. I mean, that's where you got to be. You got to go, wow, this is awesome. I remember our young brother, Michael Johnson, when he was getting up here, he's, you know, Michael comes back, you know, he's an art student there at the Portland Arts Institute, and he's got the long hair thing and all the jewelry and all the happening, and, and you know, real loose, kind of like this, you know. And, and, you know, kind of laid back. And, you know, and if you're artsy and you're cool, that's how you're supposed to be. <laughs> and I'll never forget. I mean, he gets up here to share right before his baptism. He goes, this is the happiest day of my life. I go, whoa, what happened to that boy? But after he got baptized, do you think he was ready to meet his God? I think about Anthony Echoes. Here he is. 
He's sitting back here looking all cool, calm, and collected. Comes up here. Gives this cranking prayer. Why? They had traveled 2,000 miles from New Orleans just to come and be in a church of sold-out disciples. You sacrificed that much in order to enjoy what we have. Don't you think that Anthony and his family is ready to meet God? You know, we got to ask ourselves. You know, there's a lot of controversy over this term being sold out. Now, why do you think people be bothered by the word sold out? Because they're not sold out. And some people say, well, I don't want to get back to a work salvation. But we need to understand, not only does God judge us, but 1 Corinthians 6 says we're to judge one another. Now, granted, not everything is always as it appears. We know that is not true. And so if as disciples we just simply make a snap judgment over what we think someone's done, we can go to a wrong spot. But let's not overreact right here. The Bible says that Jesus judges the churches based on their deeds. He says, I know your deeds. You're lukewarm. You see, our deeds are what evidence our heart. Now, as human beings, we can make a perception mistake. But let's not overreact to this and say, hold it. The bottom line is not how you live your life. Let me tell you something. There are a lot of people with good intentions about living the Christian life. But they're not disciples. They are not disciples. You know, how about it? Guadalupe. Diabetes. Cancer. He's with the 144,000. He's rejoicing. It was worth diabetes. It was worth cancer. Number one, remain faithful, R. Number two, envision a harvest, E. Number three, angels are at work, A. Number four, prepare to meet your God, P. What's the challenge? Reap. We got to reap a harvest of souls for salvation. But if we don't reap, the grim reaper will reap a harvest of souls for damnation. Thank you, and God bless.